Um, my name is David Clossy, and I'm the executive director of a support group called SNAP, the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests. I'm from Seattle, or excuse me, from Seattle. I am uh, from St. Louis, uh, but just to make things confusing, SNAP is a Chicago-based group. And before we do anything else, I just want to give a round of applause um, to Brian and Diane, if you would both stand up, the two key organizers of this event. And now I'll talk for six hours straight and ruin all the hard work that these two people put into this. No, I, I also want to say thank you to each and every one of you for coming right off the bat because, let's face it, uh, there are, are few subjects that are as emotionally fraught uh, and difficult as this one. Um, it takes real courage to uh, address this crisis squarely as you all are doing louder. Okay. I can do louder, believe me. All right. Um, so a couple of housekeeping announcements very quickly. Um, outside the door to the right and then to the left gets you to the restroom. Um, second housekeeping announcement, there's a solarium which is right through these exit doors. Um, or you can obviously go out this way, there's a coffee shop. Uh, please, please, please take care of yourself. This is an emotional topic, and if you need to take a break, none of us will be offended if you walk out during, well, they won't be offended. I'll take it personally if you walk out while I'm talking, but everybody else, um, please turn off your telephones if you don't mind. Um, thanks very much. And I had one other housekeeping announcement. Oh yes, uh, thanks to the museum and its staff, uh, they've graciously given free access and admission to the museum and all the exhibits to anybody who's in this room today. So if you have time afterwards and you want to see the museum, uh, please avail yourself of this opportunity. I'm going to turn it over to Diana now, and um, again, thank you all very, very, very much for being here. Good morning, everyone. I'd just like to thank you all for being here and showing support for this cause that I believe is very, very important. And um, I have a very special person here today that came, uh, him and his wife, to support, to support me and support the group. And uh, his name is James Skeet. I consider him a brother. And I'd like him to come up and do a invocation before we get started. years back we uh, traveled all across the nation to all the um, massacre sites where tribes were um, yes tribes were um, dealing with a lot of uh, um, abuse and things like that you know so you know we came up with the concept healing the land healing the people um, so that's kind of the approach that we're it's a very sacred day today and it's a day of healing
Thank you very much. Um, I do have a, I guess I lied to you earlier when I said I have a few housekeeping announcements because I now have a few more. Um, I do uh, want to stress up front that um, sometimes those of us who talk about this crisis uh, use imprecise language. And you might hear some speaker today say something about the Catholic Church. And I just want to stress that, of course, um, many of us have concerns about and criticisms of the Catholic hierarchy and its behavior. And if you hear phrases like, well, the church just doesn't get it, um, or the Catholic Church is corrupt or something, I would beg your indulgence and ask your, for you to be understanding and realize that um, those of us who are survivors increasingly get more and more and more support, uh, emotional, personal, uh, financial uh, support from lay Catholic parishioners who are deeply, deeply concerned about the safety of children. Um, and so if you hear phrases like that, that sound critical of the church, please know that what we're really referring to, of course, are the actions of um, the bishops and cardinals and others who continue, unfortunately, sometimes to put children in harm's way. Um, that being said, sometimes our language is also not inclusive enough. Um, you'll hear from people who will talk about predator priests or child molesting clerics, uh, but all of us know that uh, there are seminarians and brothers and bishops and lay teachers and Catholic school bus drivers who also molest. And the fact that we do talk a great deal about the abuse in this church is, of course, because that's where many of us or most of us were hurt. It doesn't mean that anybody here thinks that this is not happening in the Lutheran world or the Methodist world or the Jewish world. We know, in fact, that, that it does. Um, I think I can, I, I spent, I got here Monday, I've spent a couple of wonderful days meeting some of you in the room and all of you on stage, and I think I can confidently say that if there's one word that sums up why we're here today, it's the simple word prevention. Prevention. I've been with SNAP for 26 years, and I've literally talked to and heard from several thousand survivors. And if there's one common theme, I hear it sometimes in the first paragraph or the first minute of a conversation, or I might hear it at the end of a 45 minute talk, but I always hear this phrase. I just wanna make sure that what happened to me doesn't happen to another kid. Um, and, um, and that's part of the reason why I'm just so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to Diana and Brian for organizing this. I'm so grateful for each of one, each one of you being here because um, obviously I can't undo what happened to me as a child. I can't undo what happened to three of my brothers. Um, but I can take steps to safeguard kids today. And I believe in my heart of hearts, based on 26 years of experience, um, that already, already, Kids in New Mexico are safer because of this event and because of the thousands of flyers and the ads and the word of mouth. Um, every single time this horrible subject is brought up, some parent out there is a little more careful who they let babysit their kids. And so let me just applaud all of you for being a part of this prevention effort. So. Um, so let me just say two, two quick words, if I may, about um, about New Mexico. I do a lot of traveling. And somebody asked me, and I can't remember who, um, where does New Mexico fit in this ongoing crisis? And I'll just make two observations, one of which is not, the, not at all original. Um, and that is that New Mexico has been, I think, and continues to, to be the perfect storm um, for abuse, unfortunately. Uh, a largely poor, largely rural state. Um, and I think all of us know that it's much harder in a, in a tiny little town to walk into the police station. Um, and then you walk out and there are four text messages saying, hey, are you in trouble? I saw you go into the police station today, right? Then it's much harder for survivors to come forward in smaller communities, rural towns. Um, 
Then there is, of course, you know, the presence of minority groups in the state, uh, some of which tend to put priests and other clergy on much higher pedestals. And some, some communities then have a greater, much greater distrust of law enforcement officials, um, and sometimes even social workers and therapists. Um, so in a lot of ways, it's, the, it's, the, it's a great place if you're a, a pedophile. Um, but the second observation I would make is that it's also the perfect, sorry, that what I would call the perfect secrecy storm um, for, for three simple reasons. First of all, there's been virtually no independent investigation into clergy sex crimes and cover-ups in New Mexico, virtually none. In other states, you've got an attorney general who has launched an investigation and issued a report. In other states, you've got grand juries that have launched investigations and issued reports. No such action here by law enforcement. The second thing that's lacking here is that, as best I can tell at least, there's never been a single civil trial of a pedophile priest in the state of New Mexico, not one. And no matter what you might think of our justice system, uh, imperfect though it may be, civil trials really reveal the truth, not just about those who commit, but more importantly in some ways, about those who conceal this horror. And the third piece, uh, I would say, is that there's been virtually no voluntary disclosure uh, by Catholic officials in the state um, about either predators or enablers. Um, and so in, in light of no trials, no government investigations, and no voluntary disclosures, uh, I would submit that this is one of the most secretive places in the country when it comes to, uh, when it comes to this crisis. Um, and let me just say before I introduce our next speaker, um, I will just say that, you know, a tiny percentage, I think, or let's, let's say more precisely, a small percentage of men and women who are sexually assaulted as children speak up about it. Many, many survivors of childhood trauma go to their graves, never tell mom, never tell husband, never tell best friend, never tell brother or sister. Um, an even smaller group of childhood sex abuse victims ever take any legal action, criminal or civil. A very, very small percentage. And of those who do, it's literally a tiny percentage, tiny percentage of people who are sexually victimized as children speak up about their pain, take legal action, and do so publicly, use their name, as several people in this room are doing. And so, before I let go of the microphone, I just want to applaud each and every person in this room who is a survivor of abuse. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you file a police report or whether you file a civil lawsuit or whether you talk to a journalist or whether you do any of those steps. Every single one of you who is a survivor in this room is playing an important role in preventing this kind of dreadful, devastating crime to other people. And so, let, let me give a round of applause to the survivors. And if you're a survivor and you feel like standing up, please do. You don't have to. Thank you. Um, what a real talent that I have is, um, losing things, and I have lost my agenda. Does somebody have one handy that I can introduce the, introduce the next Okay, good. Um, I've talked way too long already, so this will be a very, very short introduction. I'd like to introduce Dr. Samuel Roll, who is a local forensic psychologist. Um, I jokingly told him I was going to introduce him as the best dressed guy in the room, but I don't, now that I look out at the crowd, I don't know that that's exactly fair. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Roll um, is, is an expert, widely respected in the state, uh, has taught at the college level, and we are just thrilled that he can join us today and share some of his insights from years and years of experience. Thank you, Dr. Roll. Thank you very much for that graciously short introduction. Um, I should tell you that I taught at the University of New Mexico for 33 years. That's not bragging, that's a warning. 
after teaching 33 years, you talk until the bell rings. Since we don't have a bell here, I need Mr. Hall to wave at me when I have one minute left. Uh, that's right, okay. And since we have a little amount of time, when you have a little amount of time, it's useful to talk in terms of quotations and poems and stories. And the quotation that comes to mind, especially after hearing you, the quotation that comes to mind is one by Edmund Burke. It says, all that is necessary for evil to succeed is for good people to be silent. Your presence here reduces the chance that evil can succeed. That is it. The poem I want to tell you is a very short one. Yesterday upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish that man would go away. Most people would think that that poem doesn't make any sense. But there are many people in this room who know that that poem makes sense. The man who was not there is still there. The terror that happened yesterday wakes up in the middle of the night. The pain and the emotional disaster that happened a long time ago is still around the corner. And you have to live with the fact that on the stair, that man will not go away. You will hear today stories horrific stories about abuse by clergy. And in some ways, I don't want to detract from that, but I do want to point out to you that every trauma, every human trauma, especially to a child, is like every other trauma. Every trauma is like some other trauma. And every trauma is like no other trauma. Everyone who's been hurt has been hurt in the same way. Everyone who's been hurt has been hurt in their own unique way. And I'm gonna shift the focus to a different kind of hurt and just show you how there's similarities, especially in how we remember, how we keep the man off the stair and yet the man is still on the stair. Let me, and, and it'll teach you something, hopefully, about the process of remembering and not remembering, because sometimes we talk about remembering and not remembering like it's a clear thing. Either you remember or you don't. Well, the human psyche, the human soul, the human heart, the human mind is very complex and things are very that simple. Just give me one example. This is a young woman, whole different kind of trauma. It was also trauma that happened because people were silent when they should have spoken up. I'm talking about the Nazi trauma because good Germans didn't speak up. This little girl at 10 years old was put in a camp. She was a beautiful little girl. She was a Polish girl. She was put in a camp and one of the things that happened while she was at the camp is she was repeatedly raped by SS officers. And this is how she said, she said, Dr. Roll, I was raped almost every day and I was only raped once. How can that be? She said, after the first rape, as soon as the SS officer would come into the room, I wouldn't be on my bed, on my cot, she didn't have a bed, I would be on the ceiling looking down. Some of you know what that is, that's dissociation. You're there and you're not there. You're being sodomized by a priest and you're there and you can feel the pain, but you're not there. Because it is too painful to be there. And so you go to the roof, you go to the ceiling, you go someplace else. That's what we mean remembering and not remembering. Yeah. Let me tell you another story. This is a story of a person I met early in my career. I was working in an inpatient unit for people with very, very serious seating disorders. And we would meet for like two weeks and then in the middle, the family members would come. And this woman would always say, you know, when you go to therapy, if, you, if you're married, you complain about your spouse. If you're not married, you complain about your family. And so she came and she complained about her family. But she said, my father was in a concentration camp and he never told me how horrible it was. So I feel excluded from his life because he didn't share the horror with me. And all of us in the group, and you know, the, the, the other participants and the other therapists, yeah, that is something. If your father went through something terrible, doesn't share it with you, you have been excluded from his life. So she repeated that a number of times. So when there was a family unit, 
family meetings. The other patients confronted him. Why didn't you ever tell your daughter about the horrors, your experience in the Holocaust? And the man, the father said, darling, they were in Budapest, didn't I tell you that they rounded us up in the synagogue and they grabbed my wife and they pulled her away from me when I tried to pull her back to show an example, they kicked her to the floor and hit her on the head with rifles until her brains came out of her skull. Didn't I tell you that? And she said, yes, Dad, but you never told me what it felt like. By this time, we were amazed. What, what did you have to say more than that? He says, and didn't I tell you that when I was in the camp, I thought I saw my brother and when I turned around to talk to him, one of the guards kicked me on the floor and then other guards joined and kicked me. And the reason my arm is bent this way is because it never healed after that. And the woman said, yes, Dad, but you never told me what it was really like. By that time, we were all crying. And in, in this kind of therapy, it's called psychodrama. therapy, you're not supposed to speak for anybody else. You're not supposed to say my wife thinks or my husband. You speak for yourself. But in this psychodrama, you can speak this for somebody as long as you put your hand on their shoulder to indicate that you are speaking what you think their feelings are. So I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, Dad, I heard what you told me, but I did not let myself hear the pain because I could not tolerate that much pain. And then finally, with that moment, then she began sobbing and she could not stop sobbing because she did know what her father felt, but she didn't let herself remember it. She did not let it because it was too much pain. And only in that comfort of that group meeting, only in the comfort where she knew that she could speak out, was she able to finally say, she didn't have to say it, she cried for over an hour. After which we all lit candles and said Kaddish, the Jewish morning prayer for her. And it took that long. It took that long for her to remember the pain. How could she not have felt that pain? Hearing that her father had to watch his wife kick to the floor and her brains oozing out of her skull. How could she not? But as a little girl, she couldn't tolerate that. And so it did not happen. The pain did not get through. And with every trauma, you only can let some of the pain through because it would be overwhelming it would be too overwhelming and you would be destroyed. I have a, a little boy that I was seeing, that this, they were very worried about him at school because in school, everybody was, they were teaching the kids how to debate, how not to fight with people or use that homonym. You know, they're, they're ruining these children. They won't be able to run for president. But, but, they were worried because they were talking about creation and you could be a creationist, you could talk about creation like in the Bible, like in Genesis, or you could talk about intelligent design or evolution, whichever you wanted. But the idea was that everybody would talk and vote without insulting each other and see if you could change your mind or not change your mind. And the teacher was upset not because of what his ideas were, because he stopped talking. This was the kid who had been garrulous. He had stopped talking and that worried her. And so she told the counselor and the counselor called me and so I told the little boy, what happened, because I don't, you know, don't keep secrets from my patients. And he said, Dr. Roll, I don't believe in creationism because it sounds like a fairy tale. I said, okay. Yeah, I don't believe in evolution because how can you go from an amoeba to a human being? That's too weird. And I don't believe in intelligent design because if there was intelligent design, a 10-year-old's mother wouldn't die. I believe in stupid design. Well, if it were intelligent design, priests would not rape children. But there is something intelligent about the design. That is, we have a way of protecting ourselves against enough pain that would kill us, that would destroy us, that would not let us go on. And those are the defense mechanisms. It's intelligent that we're defined that way. I'm sure you read stories every once in a while about a, a mother whose child is in some terrible situation, like a car is on the child's foot and she lifts it up and she's not even trembling, she's not even crying until the child's in the ambulance because she cannot let herself feel the terror of her child being hurt until it's over. Well, that's what the defense mechanisms are like. They protect us. They protect us. And we have different ways of doing that. 
we have different ways of blocking. Sometimes we'll block out, like the, 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 the young girl who was raped by the Nazis, she was on the ceiling, that's called dissociation. There's a way that you could be away from the reality even as you experience it. There's even some medications that they use for, for surgery that has the same effect. You cannot be there, and yet it's still there. And then when you are lucky, if you are lucky, something happens, and more and more of it's happening thanks to groups like you, where you connect again, come down the, from the ceiling, and cope with what you had to deal with. Because without coping it, it remains the man on the stair that's not there and that won't go away. But the dissociation is a very powerful and useful defense because imagine if she let herself feel and remember the full impact of daily rape by Nazi monsters. She would have died. She would have given up. She didn't because she could have that defense. There are other defenses like the woman used it who did not want to accept the pain that her father must have felt in the concentration camps. And that's one of denial, where you accept the fact, but you cannot accept the feeling. You deny the feeling. And that also serves as a kind of protection. But it's a protection that comes at a price. Because as long as you keep denying it, you can't deal with it. Here, what was the cost for this woman? The cost for this woman is she was still feeling as a grown woman, alienated from her father because she could not feel the closeness of her father's relationship because he had not let her know what terrible suffering. But he did let her know, but she couldn't receive it. She had to deny it. Now, you say, oh, deny, and that's no, you know denial a whole lot. I don't just mean in trauma, other cases. You have an argument with your spouse or your family members, and you, you say, well, you don't have to be angry. They say, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. <laughs> well, well, I think that means they're angry, but, but they have to deny the feeling. So the, the defense mechanisms we're talking about, not weird, strange things, we do them every day. And there there's the one of intellectualization, where the, you're allowed to deal with the idea, but you take away the feeling. I have heard people, I have watched people discuss trauma like the idea, like somebody reporting on the news. And only sometimes after the fourth, after the fifth, after the sixth time, they can say there's not only the mind here and the memory and the elect, there's also feelings. And when the feelings come, they usually come in a flood. But they come in a flood when somebody else is there. See, one of the, one of the important things is to have somebody else there. For me, one of the most tender stories in the life of Christ is on Holy Thursday. Remember Holy Thursday? It's a Passover. And some of you may know at Passover, you have four obligatory glasses of wine. You can have more, but four are obligatory. Now, Jesus knew he was going to be crucified the next day. But the others didn't know that. And you know, in a Samuel Johnson, the British writer said, knowing you're going to be hung the next day focuses your attention. So Jesus could not sleep, you remember, in the garden. But the, the apostles were full and, and a little bit tipsy. They were sleeping. That's what you do after you drink four glasses of wine and have a big meal. And Jesus went to them and said, come and pray with me. They said, yeah, we'll be right there. And just like you would when the fall, fell asleep. And then he said, could you not abide with me for just a little while? And they said, yeah, yeah, we'll be right there. And they never showed up. You know when they showed up? When the Romans came to take Jesus. And then St. Peter got up, chopped off the soldier's ear. You remember that story? And then Jesus put it back on. Those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. He was just fussing at Peter because Peter didn't want to come when he needed him. For me, what that story means is that people in severe pain, what they need most is not medication. What they need most is not another alcoholic drink. What they need most is someone to hear them. Jesus Christ, although he was God, he was God and man. And as man, he could not tolerate suffering unless someone was there. And what part of our mission has to be is to be there so that no one has to continue suffering alone.
I'll tell you one poem, and then I have to go. And this is to help you, to help me, to help all of us as we continue this. Because it doesn't stop, of course, right? It continues. Because the evil continues, so we continue. The earth stands out on either side. No wider than the heart is wide. Above the earth there stands a sky. No higher than the soul is high. But east and west will pinch the heart that cannot keep them pushed apart. And he whose soul is flat the sky will cave in on him by and by. In your work, in my work, my prayer, my wish for you is that you have a stout heart and a powerful soul. Thank you very much. Well, under normal circumstances, I would feel tremendous sympathy for any speaker that would have to follow a talk like that. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Wall. Um, in this case, I don't feel sympathy for the speaker because um, he himself is an incredibly eloquent man. Um, he's here, though, today not because of his eloquence, I think, but because of his courage. He is, and you thought I was crying before. Um, there are days when, I encourage someone to call him or write him, and I choke up as I begin to mention his name. Um, there's, there is no one in this movement uh, who has done more to expose corruption and prevent abuse and give hope to survivors um, than this incredibly brave person. Tom Doyle has, is the original whistleblower priest, um, who as a rising star in the Catholic hierarchy, a brilliant canon lawyer working in the papal nuncio um, under the, the Pope's own chosen representative in the U.S. In the 80s, Tom saw report after report after report from every corner uh, of this country about predator priests and um, courageously broke ranks and wrote along with um, a civil lawyer and a psychologist, um, an incredibly uh, insightful 100-something page report sent to all America's bishops, essentially saying, hey guys, we've got to change this. The you know what is gonna hit the fan. And to make a long story short, every day since then, since 1985, um, Tom Doyle has stood with us and spoken for us and paid an enormous personal and professional price for that courage, and uh, I'm just thrilled that he can be here with us today. Tom. I'll say now what I've said so many times when I've been introduced that I'm a byproduct of this whole phenomena. And the real heroes, the ones that it's really all about, are the survivors, because they have made the change possible. And I'll talk a little bit about the historical background today of this area. Uh, first thing I want to do is say that if there are any diehard skeptics here about the reality of sexual abuse of minors and children by clerics, skeptics from anywhere, the archdiocese, uh, colleges, universities, anywhere. If there are any diehard skeptics here today and you hear something you don't agree with or don't understand, please come forward and talk to one of us. This is not an adversarial environment where it's us against them. It's all of us for them. There are two dimensions of the concept of sexual abuse. One is the physical, psychological, and spiritual assault on an individual by another person. An assault that is generally sexual in nature, but its damage pervades the entire person, the spirit, 
the mind, the psyche, the body. That's one dimension. And the other dimension of it, that in many ways is more damaging, has been the response of the leadership of institutions that produced the perpetrators. Churches, schools, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, institutions. We're talking today primarily about the most important and powerful institution in the state of New Mexico, which is the Roman Catholic Church. In 1983 and 84, as was mentioned by David, the titanium cover of secrecy that prevented the vast majority of people from knowing that there was such a thing as sexual abuse of minors and children by clergy, this titanium cover was split. And it was split primarily because a very brave 10-year-old boy down in Louisiana and his parents turned down the offer of $300,000 in exchange for absolute secrecy, walked away from a bunch of money, obtained the services of an attorney, and challenged not just the perpetrator, but the church itself who had produced this man, covered him up, lied about him, and allowed him to violate hundreds of children. The concept of sexual abuse of minors by clergy did not start in 1983 or 1984. It's historically demonstrated and proven that it has been part of the fiber of the institutional Roman Catholic Church from the very beginning. The earliest writings that exist that refer to this, that forbid the elders, the male elders of the community from having sex with young boys, the earliest writing dates from 98 AD. 98. I mean, that's 98 years after the year zero. The earliest actual legislation or laws or rules enabled by the church that they themselves enacted, forbidding this, date from the year 309. And so this, this issue, this problem, has been very well known by leadership over the centuries. And they have repeatedly made various kinds of efforts to control it, to eradicate it, to control the perpetrators. And this, these efforts are, are manifest in the documentation that the church has preserved. And so there have been era after era after era where the sexual abuse of the, of the vulnerable has been known. Our era is only the latest, but the difference with our era from every era that has preceded it is this. This time, this time, the control of what's going to happen with this issue, the control of our history, is not in the hands of the elders of the institutional church, but it's in the hands, it's, in the, the, it's under the control of those who have been violated, the victims, you. You are the ones who are in charge. You may not think so when you feel beaten down and get discouraged, but you are the ones that are in charge, and you and I, none of us would be in this room today were it not for the bravery the courage, and sometimes even the temporary blindness of the victims who moved out into that area, not even knowing where they were going. And there's another dimension that has to be acknowledged, and it's the fact that we would not be here were it not for the civil attorneys who the victims began to turn to in the 80s because they took their cares and their problems to the institutional church and were turned off or lied to. But nothing happened from the church they expected would help them. So they went to the attorneys as a last resort. These were devout, believing Catholics. And these men and women from the get-go did for you what we, the clergy, should have done. Believed, listened, and supported. And that's been the case as long as I've been involved in this issue, which goes back to 1983. 
So it's, it's been around for as long as the church has been around, but the era of widespread spread public awareness in our time started in 1983, basically with two cases. One was in Minnesota, and it was a case that was lodged by Jeffrey Anderson, an attorney who is still with us and who's devoted his life to, to helping victims. And he said he, he went to court, lodged it, he didn't know what else to do. And the other was the situation in Louisiana, and that's the one that received widespread international publicity involving a priest named Gilbert Gote. And what caught the attention of the media, what caught the attention of the public, wasn't the fact that this priest had violated a bunch of children. That, that, that certainly was horrific. But what really caught their attention was the fact that he had been covered up actively by the bishop for as long as he had been ordained a priest. He committed his first act of violation of a young boy about two weeks after he was ordained in the kitchen of the rectory where he lived. And the bishops had known about him and covered it up until it just reached critical mass. And the father of one boy threatened to kill a priest not the perpetrator, but one of the priests who was involved in the cover-ups. And that kind of got their attention because they figured this guy's serious, and he was. The awareness in the United States doesn't just start in 1983, however, because there were priests known to the bishops in the 20s and in the 30s who had violated children. And many of them were sent to a place called the Seton Psychiatric Institute uh, that used to exist in Baltimore. It, it had been founded in the 19th century, and they cared, they took care of these guys, tried to take care of them. And at, at one point, their, their disorder was referred to as insanity, as schizophrenia. But the problem was, this, these were men who, were viol who had a psychosexual disorder that compelled them to sexually violate minors, male minors and female minors. <coughs> so these cases, Basically, these men were, be, were known to the bishops, not necessarily widespread, but they were known to some of them. A major turning point came in 1947 here in the Albuquerque area, when a priest named Gerald Fitzgerald founded a religious order known as the Paraclete, and I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. And this small community of priests was founded for one reason only, because Gerald Fitzgerald, the priest, felt it vitally important to have some way to help other priests who were in trouble with substances, with alcohol, with drugs, with sex, with just general burnout. And he got support from the bishops, especially one of the bishops who had been here, a bishop named Byrne, Archbishop Byrne. And they got his endeavor started, and so the order was founded in 1947, and there were facilities put together, founded in this area. Hamas Springs was the first one called Via Chele, the way to heaven. Priests were sent there by their bishops to get help. And Gerald's methodology, his only methodology of healing at the time, was spiritual. He figured the more you prayed, the better off you were. So the worse off you were, the more hours you had to spend on your knees in front of the, front of the tabernacle in the chapel. But at least he wanted to help them. But this man was a prophet because from the very beginning he had men sent to him who were sent there because they had sexually violated minors. And from the very beginning, Father Gerald knew that these men should never be in ministry. Whenever someone goes to an institution for psychiatric help, there are reports filled out. And when these men were sent to Father Gerald, he would fill out, he would send a report to the bishops that sent them, and he'd send them in the form of a letter. And several years ago, uh, two other gentlemen and myself uh, were allowed to get at the files of the paracletes at, in Santa Fe. And in there we found dozens of letters that Father Gerald had sent to bishops around the United States, the earliest one dating from 1948. These were consistent letters in which in every one he said, this man, referring to the priest, should never be allowed in any form of ministry. He should be laicized, in other words, defrocked from the priesthood for the good of the people of God. 
He made that as clear as a bell. In some of the letters, he referred to these guys as vipers, as rattlesnakes. Uh, he, he didn't have a great deal of love for them. And he, he sent this advice out to the bishops. In 1962, he came to the attention of the Holy See, of the Vatican. And he went to the Vatican, and he met with the cardinal who was in charge of what is now known as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. At that time, it was called the Holy Office. And he discussed this issue with him, the problem of priests violating kids. When he left, he was asked to write up a report, which he did, and that report now exists, in which he said very clearly, these men should not be in ministry under any circumstances. They should be removed. They should be put into a life of prayer or thrown out of the priesthood, but they should not be in ministry for the sake of the safety of God's people. A year later, he had private audiences, at least two, with Pope Paul VI, him and the Pope, one-on-one. -on -one. And he said and gave the Pope the same message, verbally and in writing. Now this is pretty solid evidence of knowledge and warning that goes way, way back. So Father Gerald was treating these men here. He finally retired in 19, I think it was 1968, from being the, the leader, the head of the facilities that, that treated these guys. Uh, unfortunately, against the advice of some of the psychologists, some of these priests were being allowed out on weekends to do weekend work in parishes. And some of them asked to join the archdiocese after their treatment finished, and they were allowed to do that. And they continued to violate children against the advice of some of the psychologists. They continued to violate children. The reason for the violation was known. The threat was known. The danger was known. And yet, in spite of this, they were allowed out there. And so the in many ways, the bishops knew from the beginning the incredible grave danger that was there from these priests who had sexually violated children, who could not be cured and could barely be controlled. And so the scope of the problem then began to be known. It was something that wasn't, it wasn't limited to this archdiocese or this part of the country. What we've learned since then, it's worldwide. And the only two places that I'm aware of where there have not been any cases of either sexual violation of children or cover-up are Greenland and Antarctica. <laughs> There's an estimate that between 6 and 10 percent of priests have violated children, suffer from the psychosexual disorder. Now the institutional church has responded in the only way it knew how, which was denial, which was to try to protect itself. Now, we've criticized that roundly and loudly and vociferously for years, but the reality is that this was the only way that the institution, the hierarchy, the clergy, knew how to respond because they themselves were threatened. Their life, their existence is severely threatened by the reality of men in their midst who had violated children. And what we have done over the years have been as to try to change <coughs> the concept of what church is, so that the good of the church involves the good of those who are hurting the most and are the most rejected, and that's the victims and their families. Because the collateral damage from sight of the sexual violation of, of, of children, it doesn't stop with the victims. There's parents, siblings, friends, the church community itself, the parish, and the wider community. I have to say that the most gut-wrenching heart-bending, painful conversations I've had with anyone in my life have been with mothers and fathers with whom I've spoken about this issue. And the pain that these people have experienced is something that cannot be adequately translated into our language. When I've had to listen to mothers and fathers talk about what it meant to them and how they felt when they found out their little boy or their little girl had been sexually violated, and then by the man they trusted more than anyone else in their life. That pain can't be translated. It can't be described. And I don't think there's any gauge that can, can figure out how deep it goes, because it just goes deep, deep, deep. So the damage 
It's not limited to the victims, it goes across the board. One of the things that has made a big difference has been when the victims, because the victims, have refused to stay silent. Now sometimes it takes years to come forward, to believe that I'm not the only one, that there is somebody out there who will help me and support me. Sooner or later, the individual, you, will break out of that prison and come out and begin to find a life that has got some good quality to it, some love in it, and some happiness. The responses, however, unfortunately, from the hierarchy, from the leadership, and not just of Catholic leadership, of other denominations, have been generally the same, which says there's something wrong with the whole notion of a religion that safeguards its leadership, its superstructure more than the people themselves. And I've seen this in, in, in our denomination and in others, other non-Christian denominations as well. But the reality is we, you, are church, not just the people with the robes on, but all of us. In fact, a little true fact for you, general population of the Roman Catholic Church is reported to be about 1.15 billion. That's a bunch of zeros. The percentage of that 1.15 billion who are clergy is point zero 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 four seven. The number of people who are actually in leadership positions who run the institutional church is about 2,800, and all of them are male celibate bishops who have never been parents. And if you have never been a parent, you don't have a clue what it means to have one of your children violated. You don't have clue one. And the best that can be done if you're not a parent is you've got to believe those who tell you how bad this is. Santa Fe, this archdiocese, was the epicenter of this issue in the 90s. And I was involved down here in the 90s, helping a couple of attorneys who were doing a lot of work with victims. You may remember some of them, a couple of them. Bruce Pasternak, who died several years ago. Merritt Bennett was another one. Steve Tinkler. These were men who represented victims down here back when it, when it, it started. And at one point in the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, there were approximately 50% of the priests had been identified as violators of minors and children. We learned here from the experience here of the profoundly powerful impact that this had on the Roman Catholic community, which is heavily Catholic here in this state, and it's heavily eth ethnic, it's heavily Hispanic, deeply imbued with Catholicism, with much of the culture of Catholicism, with the, with the uh, mythology, the, all the, everything that goes into the belief system. And one of the things that happened down here was segments of the community refused to believe this and saw the victims as the enemy and saw those who represented them as the enemy rather than as people who were trying to help make this church better, finding their own way, finding their own healing and making the institution better and they attacked them. They attacked the lawyers, they attacked the victims, uh, some of the attacks were viciously anti-Semitic because one of the attorneys was Jewish. And so we learned that this is not just a, an isolated problem. What it really is, all of it, is a horrific evidence of the dark side, not just of our church, but of society in general. Of society in general. The most important people in any church at any given time are the ones who need help the most who need relief, who need love, who need, who need support, the ones who are hurting the most, not the people on top. Most important person in the Roman Catholic Church on this day today is not the Pope. It's nobody who's wearing any kind of robes or, or outfits. It's somebody who's off in a corner isolated, filled with fear, and thinking he or she has been totally forgotten. So some of the conclusions that we learn from what's happened here Ecclesiastical authorities knew, and I mean from the top down, from the papacy down to the local level, about this issue. 
One of the things that made me furious when I first began in my involvement back in the 80s and on was the complete lack of response from the Vatican. When John Paul II was promoted to saint a couple years ago, I watched a news conference that was given by two men, one who was one of his biographers and the other one who had been his public relations man. And they, somebody asked them, well, what did he do about the sex abuse stuff? Well, he didn't know anything about it. Well, that's a lie, because I happen to be the guy who wrote a report, 42 pages long, for my boss's signature in February of 1985 that was put in the Pope's hands three days later. So he knew about it. He saw it. But over those years, from 1983, when the knowledge first got over there, clear knowledge, till the time the Pope died, there were countless letters and pleas made to the Vatican, pleading, please at least acknowledge us. Groups wanted to get together and at least be waved at by the Pope when he'd have these youth rallies in various countries. Not only were their requests not honored, they weren't even acknowledged. No one who wrote to the Vatican between 1985, 2007, ever had their letter acknowledged. That made me furious, because this outfit goes from the top down, and all it would have taken would have been one simple sentence, and things would have changed drastically. So we've learned that the default response has been to protect the image and the power of the institution, the governmental dimension. And what we've been trying to do in, in, in a very positive way sometimes and sometimes in a very challenging way is change that to help them understand that church is not just a bunch of us, you know, resting comfortably in a rectory, but it's all of us. Another dimension that we've learned is that one of the things we, you know, David talked about protecting children in the future. The institutional church has done a lot in the past 10, 15, 20 years with programs, policies, apologies, excuses, and so on. All of this has been forced on them by us, by the media, by the lawyers, by the victims. And one of the things that I think I have found to be grossly deficient has been what we call in the business the pastoral outreach to victims. When you call your parish priest and say, I was violated by Father so-and-so 30 years ago, what should happen? You shouldn't be sent to any representative who handles victims. The bishop should go to your house and sit with you and listen to you and cry with you and absorb your anger. You. That's what's important, is being there as Christ would be there. The system, what's needed, is a vast systemic change. A systemic change that stresses the importance and the care of those who've been harmed, first and foremost. That insists upon openness and honesty. Because a church that is open and honest, that stands up and says, yes, we did this, we allowed this to happen, we permitted it to happen, we're sorry, we take the blame. That's what it's really all about. They, then they stand tall, much taller than saying, but it's somebody else's fault. We didn't understand. We didn't know. We're on a steep learning curve. Any adult male today, any day that says, I really didn't know until 10 years ago that having sex with a kid is illegal and harmful to the kid is either an idiot or can't come from another planet. Yet that's one of the things that we've encountered. The system itself won't fix itself because it cannot. It can be fixed from the outside, and from the outside is us. I want to end with two things. One, I'm sure that given the deeply imbued Catholicism in this, this state and in a lot of places, there's a lot of guilt on the part of a lot of people who feel that they're hurting God, they're hurting the church by coming forward, by disclosing this, by, by, by suing. You're not hurting anybody. You're hurting by not doing it. 
but you're helping by doing it because you're helping the institution be what it should be, which is not an institution, but the body of Christ. I remember being at a... One of the things I've done over the years is try to help people with their spiritual healing. And oftentimes, the only thing that we can do with that is not to go back to church. That's like, you know, asking Jews to go to Auschwitz for Thanksgiving or something. But helping people look at all of this, look at the meaning of church and priesthood, and eventually at your understanding of the higher power itself. And so many will finally have the courage to say, I cannot believe any longer. I was at a press conference several years ago in Delaware, and a trial had ended and a, a man was vindicated, a victim. And then one of the people in the media said, do you still believe in God? And he looked at him and he said, how can I believe in a God who would allow one of his priests come down and sexually violate an eight-year-old boy time after time after time after time. Which is, that changed my theology, listening to that. And the final thing I want to say is this, if you ever wonder about the worth of what you've done, coming forward, of the whole thing, keep this in mind. It's a little saying that I have written in a plaque on my wall. And 100 years from now, it will not matter the kind of car I drove, the size of my house, or how big my bank account was. But the world will be a better place because I have been important in the life of a child. Every one of you can say that to yourself, and you can say that to yourself now because you have been important in the lives of children you will never know who are not yet born because of what you've done for vindication for yourselves and for the future. Thank you. Um, we're about to hear from the, uh, the some brave, very, very brave men and women. And um, before we do, however, I, I want to acknowledge two other groups of people very, very quickly. If you feel comfortable, if you feel comfortable, um, I'd like you to stand up. Uh, if you are a loved one or relative or spouse or partner or friend of a survivor, because uh, you all are heroic for being here and supporting all of us. So please, if you would stand up and let us acknowledge you. I said to one woman before the event happened, the mother of a brave survivor, I, I said, you know, I thanked her and I said, it may seem like a no-brainer to you. Of course you're gonna support your son, but uh, you would be surprised even now how many moms, dads, siblings uh, disbelieve a survivor who manages to break their silence. And uh, I, I think I can speak pretty safely for every survivor here. None of us would be here if not for the love of people like you, so thank you. I also want to acknowledge a group of people who are not here. Um, this is not a SNAP event officially. Again, this is Brian and Diana and John and these other brave folks. But at the start of every SNAP event, we uh, stand up and we have a moment of silence. The name of the group, again, is the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, and we chose that name very carefully, and uh, specifically because, in fact, of course, an awful lot of people who endure what we've endured um, do not survive. Um, and they take their own lives. So if everybody here would just join me in a minute, please stand up in just a moment of silence on behalf of our brothers and sisters who are no, are no longer with us.
Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce a very brave woman who played a huge role in not only organizing this, but getting people to come to this event. Um, one of the great myths, Tom, Tom did a great job of talking about the excuses and ducks and dodges by the church hierarchy. And one of the great myths that bishops put out there to minimize this crisis. And there's only about, I don't know what, 80, 90, 100 such myths. But one of the myths that we hear is, uh, well, is mostly boys. Uh, in fact, in, in our SNAP membership, half, half of our members uh, are women who are sexually exploited as kids uh, and, and oftentimes as young, vulnerable adults. Um, so I'm especially, I'm grateful to every survivor who's here, but I'm especially grateful to female survivors who are speaking up. And uh, I want you all to give a warm welcome to Diana, who's a real hero. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm here today um, just to let everybody know that there is help out there. And I, I, I do want people to know that um, I was Jane Doe B uh, when I filed my case. And now I'm Diana Beta. This is probably one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do in my life. Um, just telling my family what happened and just really coming to the reality that this is what happened to me as a child. And what was always told to me by the perpetrator was, don't tell. So I wanted to just start off with a little bit of history about Catholicism and what it meant to our family. And I think many other families within New Mexico, I believe especially to Hispanic families and probably to uh, a lot of Native American families uh, as well who were forced into, forced into the religion. But a Catholic family does not uh, wait until a child is old enough to make his or her own decision about becoming a Catholic. Most babies are baptized into the church within a month, few weeks of birth. Uh, it's kind of like your sign sealed and delivered. Um, and if you'll see on the top there, the top left is a baptismal. Uh, the middle picture is the Holy Communion. And then the third picture is uh, a young man uh, re receiving his confirmation. And I'd like to also stress the fact that this is not just a religion, it's a culture for our people. It's something that's really embedded into our lives. Uh, we're, we're born into the families, it's been just passed down from generation to generation. And we as children don't have a choice. It's our parents, their parents, and their parents. And so we don't question it. It's just something that we accept as uh, young people, as even adults. Um, it's, just, it's just what it is, and uh, it's who we are. And here is a picture of several different um, altar children or altar servers within different churches. And I can remember as a child, uh, I could hear the priest telling the, mainly the boys at that time, because in the 60s, there were no children, um, no uh, uh, female children who were altar servers. And I can remember the priest using that expression of keep calm and become an altar server which I think is very ironic because um, this was one of the ways priests were able to take advantage of the relationships with the children to gain access. And as a result, many children were sexually abused while being ser servers 
in providing this service. And it wasn't just young children, it was teenagers and young adults. Uh, they wanted to serve God and they wanted to become close to the priests and parents and families encouraged uh, this type of involvement. Uh, they, too, they too thought it was a very good way to give back and to provide a service and become close to the priest who were believed to be holy. And here we go with the choir, uh, children's choir. And a lot of the priests were the ones who were organizing the choirs, uh, welcoming in new members, encouraging new members. And again, in turn, um, as children, um, they were participating in the choir. I myself was in the choir at Our Lady Guadalupe Church. And I truly believed as a young child that I was singing directly to God and that this was another prayer through song with my relationship with God. I wanted to sing well and I wanted to sing loud so that God himself could hear me. Uh, sadly, this was another form of access for the pedophile priest, uh, priest to sexually abuse children. And here in the Bible, it clearly speaks of God's dis disapproval of anyone who harms children. And yet over many decades, priests um, had a, a pedophile play playground, not just here in New Mexico, but all over the nation and all over the world. They, were co they covered for each other, and it, was not a, and, it was, and it was an acceptable behavior in their eyes, and that it was not considered a crime. If the clergy believed it to be unacceptable then and today, hundreds of priests would be incarcerated. And if you'll notice under Matthew chapter 18, verse 2 through 6, um, number 6, but if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. And this is the word of God. Excuse me. This is a picture of Our Lady Guadalupe where our family attended. <clears throat> Most of us were there to receive our sacraments. Uh, my oldest sister was even married uh, at this church. And um, so I was baptized here. I received my first Holy Communion and I was confirmed at Oleta Guadalupe. And I went to catechism classes here. Uh, which were held at the parish hall, and one of my sisters was a catechism teacher there too. And my brother was an altar server. And here's a picture of our Holy Eucharist, the bo uh, body and blood of Christ. And if you look at the picture on the very left-hand corner on the bottom, Holy Communion is the shortest and safest way to heaven. And that was from uh, Pope St. Pius. So pedophile priests were providing the sacrament of Holy Communion on the altar where children were actually raped. They were c committing crimes against children and providing Holy Communion as criminals. These bad priests had no right to be administering the sacrament of Holy Communion while violating children. They should have been imprisoned just like any other criminal. And I feel, and I, I, I believe that, how could this be holy communion when these priests were doing this to children? Maybe it was communion, but it wasn't holy communion. To me, it was a violation of the sacrament. And here's a picture of Walter Cassidy. He's the priest who molested me on a school bus. 
from the ages of eight to 10 years old. For any of you who knew Father Cassidy or Lady Guadalupe, he was a very large man. He was about maybe six foot two. And for those of you who may have known him, is he had a terrible body odor. If he left the room, that odor stayed behind. This is the picture of me receiving my first Holy Communion from Father Cassidy, and my parents are standing beside me. <coughs> and this day was an exciting day for all of us. As a child, I believed that receiving the body and blood of Christ would make me closer to God. Shortly after this time, Cassidy started sexually abusing me. I was digitally, digitally raped by Cassidy from the ages of eight to 10 years old. He used his authority to threaten me, to instill fear in me. He told me, don't tell. Don't tell anyone. If I did tell, my parents and my family would burn in hell. As a child, it was fight, flight, fight, or freeze. At eight years old, all I could do was freeze physically, verbally, and emotionally. <clears throat> Excuse me. At that time, I didn't understand what was happening to me. All I knew was that there was blood and pain. I knew nothing about sex or sexuality. I didn't know anything about my body as far as my female anatomy. This monster took my innocence from me. I knew that no one else that I knew ever touched me or hurt me like he did. I was confused and scared. I thought he worked for God. I thought he was a man of God. I thought that he would be my only chance to get to heaven because he was doing God's work. This crime occurred on a catechism bus. Here's some more scripture. A warning against hypocrisy. And if you look at number two, midway into the first paragraph, you'll see that nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered behind closed doors will be pro proclaimed from the housetops. And the second reading, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that can do, more, can do nothing more, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. This is Satan. Again, I tell you, fear him. Are you not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them has forgotten in God's sight. But even the hairs of your head are all counted. Do not be afraid. You are of more value than any sparrow. And I'm here today to bring out what was done in secret. Before I became forward, before I came forward and told even my family what had happened to me, I felt so much shame. What did I do wrong? Not until I started to receive help and found a good psychologist and therapist and found an excellent attorney and his team, Brad Hall, who said to me, Diana, the first thing you have to do is get help. I can't help you. 
until you get that help. And I'll never forget that day. I didn't understand or connect the dots in my life with certain behaviors, lack of trust, binge drinking. Just, I could go on and on about that. But in my adult life, I was becoming aware of various truths, such as these crimes committed are an epidemic on our children in our state. I do believe that not all priests are bad, but those who are bad are really bad. And I think it's time we weed out the bad apples. And here's a picture of a young adult and a child looking for hope. Light needs to shine on every dark place of an abused child. I believe that light is hope. The Catholic Church has been an institution of fear and threats, and so much has been done in secrecy. These crimes need to be exposed to the light. The Church needs to expose the records of all the abused cases. Had the Church been transparent and truthful, so many lives could have been saved. So many victims are not with us today because they couldn't cope with what had happened to them. The next scripture is John. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The ones who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So as a victim, this is very, it's very difficult to, re, to, to seek help. But I found that there is help out there. I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only one who Cassidy raped or abused. I realized that I am not alone, and it's not my fault. I did nothing wrong, nothing to deserve what happened to me as a child. We all need to be aware of these sexual predators. We need to improve our community and parental awareness and understand the magnitude of these crimes that are committed in silence in the name of God. Please protect our children. It's easier to protect a child than it is to fix an adult. And I feel that if a priest or anyone who claims to be a person of God and is righteous isn't capable of committing these heinous crimes. So the last thing I want you to, to all take away today is that please tell your kids, tell your families, it's okay to tell. Please tell. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Very much. And, I, and I would just go one step further. I, it's not okay to tell. It's crucial to tell. It's crucial for your own well-being, and it's crucial for the safety, for the safety of kids. Um, Tom Doyle was right when he said, "This need not be adversarial. It need not be us versus them." But for many survivors, it feels like that. Unfortunately. And justifiably, understandably, it feels like us versus them. And to any survivor who has that feeling, if it feels like a battle or a fight, I would simply say to you, you have already won. You have already won. Just by being in this room, just by having disclosed to a loved one, no matter what the criminal courts may do, or the civil courts may do, or the legislature may do, or the 
church hierarchy may do or your predator may, may do. You have survived and you have shared your burden and you're getting support and you're getting healthy and uh, you've already won. It's now um, my honor to uh, introduce another incredibly courageous uh, person uh, who will tell you his real name today for the first time in public. Um, he is known in legal papers as uh, John Doe P. And uh, I'm thrilled that he's with us today. I urge you to welcome him. My name is John Lund, formerly John Doe P. I was raped by a priest named Father Clive Lynn in 1973 and 1974 when I was 12 years old at St. Therese Church in Albuquerque. I was a choir boy recruited by Father Lynn and I never knew what the term grooming meant. All I knew was that this man was my best friend, my mentor, my father figure, my hero. Then he raped me. During one of the rapes in the sacristy area, we were caught. I was crying out. Someone opened the door, slammed it shut, and they saw. <laughs> Father Lynn was gone the next day, and I lived for the next 40 years believing it was my fault. It was my fault. Worse than being raped was living with the guilt and shame of knowing that I caused this man of God, to lose his status, his livelihood, and I ruined his life because I cried out. I was a 12-year-old boy, and all I wanted was to be loved. I spent the next few years in an alcohol and drug-induced days. I was in a situation where I had easy access to both. And what do you do at 12 to dull the pain? What do you do? When I got married, the most wonderful human being got put on this earth. I turned into a workaholic finding any way I could to punish myself, to ruin myself, to damage myself because of the need to be punished for what I had done to Clive Glenn. When things would go right in my life, I couldn't tolerate it. I didn't deserve it. I needed to be punished for the bad person I was for taking down this man of God. The coping mechanisms I had subconsciously used all those years to bury those horrible thoughts of the rapes and the shame all came to a crashing end on November the 19th, 2014. An article appeared in the Albuquerque Journal with the name Father Clive Lynn in it whom I hadn't heard about or read in over 40 years. It was like he jumped off of the pages of that newspaper, grabbed me by the throat, held me down, and raped me all over again. <laughs> My wife was at work. I was at home alone. 
I cried uncontrollably for hours. I couldn't take the pain any longer. I needed help. The only reason I can stand right here today is because of the incredible therapy that I'm receiving and with the love and help of my family, my friends, that I can stand here and reach out to other survivors. And I want to tell you, you are not alone. You're not alone. You don't have to carry this pain. You don't have to carry this by yourself. It took over 40 years for me to tell anyone what had happened. The pain, the pain, not just the physical pain, but the emotional pain, the scars of, of a ruined life, of a life you try to hide, that you try to keep secret. But then, on top of all of that, comes the awful truth that Father Lynn and so many other pedophile priests were shuffled from parish to parish only to molest other children again and again and again. That even worse is to have the Archdiocese of, Archdiocese of Santa Fe and other dioceses around the country hide and cover up the secrecy, the extent of the sexual abuses, and the mind-boggling numbers of victims. I hold no ill will to anyone of the Catholic faith or any priest who is genuinely serving the Lord and nurturing and caring for God's people. And I respect anyone who is here, who is not here, who will hear about this or read about this. I respect their decision to remain a John or Jane Doe. But for me, I find this a way to shed the guilt and the shame that I've carried around for over 40 years. If by dropping my anonymity will encourage even one person one person to get help, then it'll have been worth it. You don't have to live in guilt and shame anymore. I know in my heart that there are more victims out there. There are more people like us. Maybe there's some of you here today. There is help. There's healing. There's love. It may not be apparent, but for a while my faith was torn, destroyed. And thank God I found a church that cares for its people in Calvary of Albuquerque. And I appreciate the love of everyone at the church. And I thank all of you for being here today. God bless you. The next brave survivor you'll meet is known in legal papers as John Doe N. Um, but like John Lund, this brave man is breaking his silence today. Welcome, John Doe. My name is Louis Toya, and I'm a member from the Pueblo of Haines, Pueblo. The uh, Catholics go away back on Pueblos. Often we are sent to schools. When I was 14, 
I was sent, I was sent to St. Catherine's School for Native Americans in Santa Fe, which was run by an order of nuns and an order of Franciscan brothers under the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. When I was a freshman, I had strep throat and a fever while living in my dorm room and was sent to one of the one of the Catholic brothers for medical attention. Brother Dennis Huff lived on the first floor. He, ab Take your time. he abused me for several weeks, many nights, pretending it was medically related. I never graduated from that school, and instead I ran away and started drinking. I later graduated from Albuquerque Indian School. The past 10 years, I have been alcohol free. I fell once. I fell once, but I got up. Recently, recently, the years of forced secrecy and shame gave way, and I found help. Even through my litigate, even though my litigation name is uh, John Doe N, my real name is Louis Toya. I know, I I no longer am hiding any secrets for the Catholics, and. I want to thank everyone for being here today, my family, friends, thank you. If I may interject before we have our next speaker, I, we've never done a survey in SNAP. We have 22,000 members. Um, and I don't know that there's been research like this. Tom may know, but um, I can tell you anecdotally, um, easily, 90% of the survivors who we've dealt with, men, women, adult children, 90% have tried to cope with and dull the pain through some kind of addiction. Sex, booze, drugs, work, um, you know. And, and the, uh, one of the ironies and tragedies of this is that oftentimes church defense lawyers will essentially say, or church PR officials will, will say, well, why should we believe, you know, Clarence? You know, he's had four DUIs, right? Um, and and I, I just turn it around. I say, well, imagine you come home from work and you see your spouse and say, how was your day, honey? And she said, well, it was fine. I had a wonderful day. I was run over by a train. And you don't see a Band-Aid on her body. <laughs> okay, that's the story you should be skeptical of. The person who says, I endured horrific childhood trauma and betrayal. But I've led the life of a Boy Scout, and I've never even returned a library book late. That's the survivors whose story that you might uh, you might doubt. Um, and so, fellas, I will just tell you, and Diane as well, you know, you are in, in uh, great company. Um, and you, you know, um, the, the, the single most common coping mechanism is some type 
of addiction, uh, coupled oftentimes with minim minimizing. So often, you know, we've heard a story that is worse than our own. I was not molested at gunpoint, right? I wasn't molested in a boarding school where my perpetrator had access to me every single night. So one way I can cope with the trauma is by saying, well, I didn't have it as rough as she did or he did. Um, but every incident of abuse, whether you're 7 or 17 or 27, um, whether it was penetration or whether it wasn't, whether you were threatened or whether you weren't, whether you were sober or whether you were drugged up, every betrayal is devastating. And that's why the courage of these folks today um, and their strength, we, we've talked a lot about their courage, but their strength for having endured it and having uh, stood up before you today is just so, so deeply moving. Next, I'd like to introduce Jane Doe C, who will soon be Jane Doe C no more. Thank you. Um, yesterday I was Jane Doe C, and today I am Lydia Estrada. I'm a survivor. It took a long time to know that I am a survivor. I am a victim no more. Walter Cassidy was, I'm not going to call him a father because he doesn't deserve that respect. He was the man that sexually molested me from the time I was 10 years old in his catechism class. Where we as children go, because, well, you got to learn about God somewhere, don't you? And who else better to teach you than the priest that sits there in the, in the pot and tells you? But God, we're children. We're only, we only know what we're told. They say, we go to confession when you're a child. What are we confessing? How many of us did not make up a lie to confess? Because we were there. We had to, oh, we stole the nickel. Oh, I mean, you know, we made up stuff so we could get the bread, the host, whatever, you know. And I, I'm, I did it all the time because that was what my, my family expected it. You had to go to confession on Saturday. You're a child, what do you confess? Now I'm a 10 years old boy, they got a lot to confess. This was the 60s, I was 10. This went on for two years. And until I left his catechism class, where you move up into another class of older children, I did speak up, I told my family, I got the beating of my life. My grandfather was a very devout Catholic. I was a liar. I, was, I felt like dirt. And after that, why would you say anything again? It took 40 years plus until I started hearing about this. I, I read in a paper also, Father Cassidy's name just jumped out at me. Talk about bad memories. I had held it. Where you're supposed to stash awful, awful things. And I couldn't understand why it had all come forward. Today I understand why. After therapy, I realize it's because we need closure. And the only way you can get closure is to face what put you there. Father Cassidy, he's dead. We will never get to face him. He will never get to hear what he did to me, Diana. And who knows how many others that are afraid. You're afraid to come forward. You need to not be afraid. Because yes. you only hurt yourself and the people that you love and you care about you. And it's a vicious cycle. It really is. If you... I was not a good mother to my children. I did not have a good mother. She didn't have a good mother. It goes on and on. I'd like to think that now that I'm older and my children are older and I'm a grandmother, now I am learning to love my children, to hug them, and to tell them that I love them. I was never given that. And I'm sure there's a lot of us in this age group that weren't. Our parents weren't even shown love. How are they supposed to show it to us? We need to break that cycle. We need to save the children. Today I was told by a very good friend of mine that he would be embarrassed to stand here 
and give his name because he was embarrassed what people would think. I don't care what people think. No one should. You should not care that, that oh, they're going to think. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. For years and years, I thought God had abandoned me, and I abandoned the church. First chance I got, as, old as, as soon as I got old enough to say, I am not going anymore. I haven't been in a Catholic church in forever. I do attend Christian church when I go, but even now I still have doubts. I feel that he sometimes is just, why? Why, 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 why? It's a question we all ask, why? 10 years old, eight years old, seven years old. How can you allow that? As you get older, you realize, it wasn't God's doing. These are men, with men with minds of their own, with black hearts. Who else but a monster would do something like that to an innocent child? And you know why they do it to children? Because who believes us? We're children, children lie. They spread stories, they make everything bigger than it should be, that's why. And when you do tell, nobody believes you. So after a while you just forget about it and you don't say nothing. Nothing. Thank God for Brad Hall and his team. Thank God for Brad Hall. Because if it wasn't for him, me, myself, I, and the rest of us, we'd still be floundering. We'd be lost. We'd still be in the dark. There is light at the end of the tunnel. For those of you, please, if you are in that situation, don't be afraid to speak. Don't hold it in for 45 years or so because it kills you. We all were alcoholics, drug addicts, workaholics. We all didn't do what we were supposed to do with the lives that we were given. We should have been doing more. And we couldn't. Why? Because a priest took it upon himself to steal that innocence, to just make you feel like, like nothing. And as a child, it's so important. This is when you get molded into the adult that you're going to be. If you're broken as a child, you'll be broken as an adult. That's just the way it goes. That's just the way it is. And until you know when you realize that and someone reaches out to help you and you get help on your own, you will be broken until you die. You need to be fixed. And if you know you need to be fixed, please, please reach out to someone. There's so many support groups. There's therapists. There's... Don't go to the church. I'm sorry. Just don't go to the church. That's just... That's my personal opinion, and I'm sure people want, uh, uh, but that's, I would never, never. And Grant Taylor, I can say, this man is dead. He could never hurt anybody else again, but he killed me inside. He killed the me. What I could have been, who knows? I became an alcoholic, drug addict. You know, when you have stuff like that stuck against you, where do you end up? It's not good. So please, if you know someone, or you even suspect, and this could have been 40, 50 years ago, it is never too late. You need to closure. You need closure. Thank you. So far today, we have um, acknowledged and expressed appreciation um, for abuse survivors, um, specifically for Diana and uh, Brian for organizing this. We've expressed, uh, we've acknowledged those of you who are not survivors but are loved ones and relatives of survivors. Uh, we've acknowledged an incredibly brave whistleblower. Um, but join me please now in acknowledging and honoring and showing gratitude to these four incredibly brave and eloquent uh, and strong survivors for their powerful, powerful testimony today. And by saying that, I didn't mean to say we're over. We're going to hear from one more incredibly courageous man. Welcome, Mark Lemire. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I want to say that uh, I'm not involved in any kind of litigation. Uh, 
at this point in time, but I tell you what I need to do. I need to share some experiences with you and really come up and acknowledge the victims and communicate my appreciation for the strength that you have and the strength that I didn't have. Uh, because if, if I had, maybe there would have been some victims that might have been protected. I was, uh, I was actually uh, abused by Father Perot at uh, Our Lady Guadalupe. Catholic family, I was 11, 12 years old. Uh, I was molested for years. I don't even know how it ended. Uh, taken to Mexico, taken to Santa Fe. When I was molested the first time, the priest took me to church and prayed the rosary and told me never to tell anybody. I, I told my mother, and, and my mother's dead now, and uh, she told me never to say anything about a Catholic priest again. And I, I didn't know what to do. I felt that was lost. Well, I put those memories away, and uh, I always felt there was something wrong with me. And I ended up burying myself in work, Athletics, uh, I won a national championship for the University of New Mexico. I could endure a lot of pain and, and not really sure why. Uh, I'll tell you this, I've got family members that don't know. So I'm, um, after hearing these individuals with the courage they have, thinking, you know, what kind of man are you if you don't get up? Because my story is a little bit unique, and it's unique from a perspective is that before Mr. Doyle, and I really appreciate that, uh, before Pasternak, before any of these other cases, I was in the 90s. I had been going to therapy because my wife was ready to divorce me because I had this uncontrollable anger that I had no idea where it came from. And uh, my wife said, you need to get help. And um, I said, what, why do I need to get help? I'm coaching, I'm teaching, I work my ass off. I don't know what you're talking about. She said, you got some kind of uncontrollable anger. Well, unfortunately, I went to a, a Christian counselor, or fortunately, and mind you, this is before anything hit the press. And uh, it came out in a therapy session, and uh, we approached the archdiocese. And I met with the archbishop, met with my perpetrator. I wasn't ready to. I met with the attorneys, and I was told time and time and time and time again that this never happened. Uh, I felt like I, I was all alone. Uh, I come to find out that the, I was recommended an attorney, and the attorney that represented me happened to be on the board of the church. Uh, my contract with the church was to get Father Perot out of the out of the church and my contract was to go ahead and and assure that he'd never molest a, another young boy again and that was the agreement unfortunately the pain is I know some victims out there that all he was they denied it all that happened was they moved him to other parishes and others were abused uh, when Pastor Matt came aboard, I started hearing the names of people that I knew, and I'm going to tell you, I, uh, I wanted to take my life several times. And uh, I have a disabled child, uh, and I almost felt that maybe God punished me for those actions, and he's having to suffer. But I, I saw, I saw a uh, newspaper article in one of the victims of Perot, and as a lot of these individuals have said, when I saw his picture again, is like he jumped out. I know this now that uh, he's uh, pleasantly uh, south of Europe. Uh, he's working in a university. Uh, and I, I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to make it hell on him. Uh, I'm going to make it hell on him. Because he should, he should be in jail. You know, he should be in jail. And uh, 
The secrecy, I, I can't even imagine to tell you. I, I have had uh, issues with therapy. I've just recently, I'm only on my third therapy session with a therapist. Uh, you know, uh, I still have a lot of issues, but I want to say this, and I, I mean this sincerely. Number one, it's good to know that y you weren't the only one out there because for 40 some years, that's what I felt like. And then to know I used to question when Perot would abuse me in the rectory, in the church, at the Air Force Base, oh, Cassidy was there. And I kept thinking, why does he come into the room? Where, where is he? You know, uh, you know, he, this is a man of God. I mean, very similar. I was brought up that way. And, and now I know why he wasn't there. Uh, he was busy indulging his own pleasure. But uh, again, I, I, I didn't plan to come up here. Uh, I looked at these individuals and the courage that they have and the support that they have for their family. And I, I do agree that this silence has to end. And uh, I, I have all my family still in the Catholic Church and I am, do not condemn it. I do not. Uh, I have not gone to church. I, I can't go to church. I felt God has abandoned me. And, uh, but I'll tell you what. We have to do something to take those individuals out. Amen. We have to do it. Because if the, those children cannot protect themselves, for the longest time I blame myself. I blame myself that it must have been me. I must have done something. I, I must have gave some type of vindication. And uh, I look back on it and saying 11, 12 years old, I didn't even know what the hell to order in a restaurant. And to be molested and raped and taken to church and prayed the rosary and say, don't you say this to anything. Don't you talk, communicate to your parents because they will go to hell and you will go to hell. But uh, what I want to do is communicate my appreciation for these brave individuals to come up and who have uh, shared some dark secrets. And uh, I just hope and pray that God continues to bless the family of God. And this isn't hidden any longer. And... Uh, Thank you. Wow. Um, we're, we're sort of winding down. I've been asked to speak briefly about the statute of limitations. And, and if, I, if I may, um, I'm hoping somebody out there is asking themselves, well, what do we do now? Um, I just got this question from a television reporter. And um, I will humbly offer just a couple of, of quick suggestions. Um, the first is, please, ask your loved ones. Ask your friends, did somebody hurt you as a kid? It's an incredibly awkward conversation to have. Incredibly awkward and intrusive. But have that conversation, please. Because if you ask 10 people, one of them may say yes. And it may be just the invitation they've been waiting for for 20 or 30 or 40 years. And you may be just the person they trust sharing that secret. Um, number two, uh, there's a website called bishopaccountability.org, Bishop Accountability. Raise your hand if you've seen this website before. Okay, it's a tremendous source of information. Um, here's how goofy and obsessive I am. I've printed out the list of perpetrator priests um, in Missouri, where I'm from. And I keep it in the glove compartment of my car. <laughs> Um, because if somebody says to me when the topic comes up, well, what about Father Albert? Did you, you know, I will literally pull that out of my glove compartment or out of my briefcase and find, find his name. Um, number three, I would encourage you uh, to go to our website, snapnetwork.org, snapnetwork.org. The purpose of our group, we're a, um, both a support and advocacy group, been around 27 years, completely nonprofit, completely independent. 
of any church body. Um, we had a terrific support group meeting here last night. Um, we plan on holding them more regularly in New Mexico. It's just a safe, welcoming, private place where you can share your story, be believed, be supported, and move closer towards recovery. Um, if you register on our website, which means just giving us your email address, you will hear about other events that we're doing. Um, it's, again, the website is snapnetwork.org. And my final bit of advice, before we hear a little bit more about addictions, my final bit of advice to you, or my plea to you, would be contact your lawmakers and tell them to end this incredibly archaic, arbitrary, predator-friendly statute of limitations that slams the courthouse door on people like the folks you've just heard from. You know, let's be brutally honest. Kids are safest when predators are jailed, right? But the biggest impediment to that is the, these laws that say you have X number of years from the time you turn 18 or X number of years from the time you turn 21. Um, and it is heartbreaking for a survivor to summon the courage and strength to come forward and walk into the police station or walk into the DA's office only to be told, wow, if you'd have just gotten here six months sooner or six years sooner, why in the world do we have a legal system that encourages those who commit and conceal child sex crimes to destroy evidence and intimidate witnesses and uh, stonewall law enforcement uh, and keep it under wraps, right, for just a couple more years and then we'll be home free. That's what this crazy statute of limitations does and it happens civilly and it happens criminally. Um, and, that, and it enables church officials to say, well, we just don't know who to believe. We can't really tell who to believe. Well, that's what our justice system is, imperfect as it, as it may be. That's what our justice system does, right? But only if you can get in the courthouse door. And that only happens when these awful statutes of limitations are repealed. The good news is that the, Martin Luther King said, um, the moral arc of the universe is long, sorry, but it bends towards justice. And it is bending towards justice. More and more lawmakers all across the country are eliminating or extending these statutes of limitations. And it's got to happen here. Um, so please, just contact your lawmakers and, and say, why do we have this arbitrary, archaic time limit that enables predators to silence their victims just long enough so they can go out and victimize more kids? Um, I'm going to turn it over now again briefly. When I did the introduction of Tom Doyle, um, I neglected to point out um, his other role. Um, he's, in addition to his role, obviously, as a great whistleblower, um, he's been a longtime addictions counselor. So he's going to say a few words, not with his priest hat on, but as his expert um, in dealing with addictions. So welcome back, Tom Doyle, please, for a moment. <laughs> First thing I'd like to say to Louie and John and anybody else in here who has uh, uh, struggled with addiction, especially alcohol, uh, my name is Tom and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I've been one, I've been, I've been sober for, right now it's two days short of 24 years. If I hadn't hit bottom when I did, I probably would have never been able to find the uh, empathy, the sympathy, the understanding, limited though it is, that I've grown to, that I've learned about for you and, and the many survivors and their families that I've met over the past 30 years. Uh, it was in the, that experience of hitting bottom that I learned really what spirituality is all about. There's a saying that we've thrown around, at least in my group, the difference between a religious person and a spiritual person is this. A religious person doesn't want to go to hell. 
spiritual person has been there and doesn't want to go back. <laughs> and I would say to those of you, anyone who is struggling and who perhaps has been in the program, been a friend of Bill, um, people say to me sometimes, where do you go to church now? I go to the Church of St. Bill. That's the one that really works. AA. Uh, if you're struggling and you fall, um, and you feel ashamed, and you feel humiliated, and you feel defeated, get up. Because it takes a hell of a lot of courage to acknowledge that you've got this issue to start off with, but you're stronger than it is. And so when you get up again, uh, it only multiplies your strength and never be ashamed. Um, I know that resorting to alcohol, to drugs, to some form of addictive behavior is, a re is something that so many have done and had to do to try to find some way to quell the pain. Makes sense, it's understandable. But sooner or later, you're more important than the pain, and you take over control of that monster that violated you. And when you take over control, that means you're in charge of your anger. He's no longer in charge. And you're in charge of the way to stop that pain. And the best way to stop it, I think, is in some way or other, if it's related to addictions, is to get on top of that. So I have the highest respect and, and, and admiration for those of you who've been there and where we have been and have come out. So God bless you. May Bill bless you. The other thing, two little things I'd like to say. A lot of people have talked about, well, I don't, don't go to church anymore. I was a devout Catholic. I'm not really sure anymore what a devout Catholic is. It sure as hell isn't somebody who goes to church all the time. Because being a Catholic doesn't mean being in church all the time. Jesus Christ, the only time he ever got angry was when he went to church. And what he got angry about was the hypocrisy on the part of the guys that were running the church. So you can be a good Catholic and a good Christian primarily when you're a good Christian. And sometimes we're accused of, I'm accused all the time of hurting the church. I don't need to hurt the church. It'll hurt itself well enough. But... What we, what I'm trying to do, what we are trying to do is help it become what it's supposed to be, the body of Christ. Not an organization, not a structure, not a bunch of ceremonies, but people, helping people. That's what we're all about. And so if you feel any smidgen of guilt about walking away, or any smidgen of guilt about suing or any of that, banish it. Because the higher power that some of us believe in is a lot bigger than churches. It's a lot bigger than Mass on Sunday or confession or, or any of that stuff. And if you are stuck with a God that you think is going to get mad at you because you sued him or his church, get mad at you because you blew the whistle on the perpetrator, fire that God because he's not the real one. Amen. Now, the, the last thing, and this is, this is sort of personal. I was in the Air Force for almost 20 years. And I was more proud to put that blue uniform on than I was my black suit and Roman collar. Because I found in the Air Force consistent integrity. There were time and time again that I had to ask for permission to take time off to go to a trial, to deposition, to meet with victims or something like that. And I always got it. Because I was supported consistently by the officers, by my by the, the, com the command structure of the Air Force. And they often told me they're proud of what I was doing because I was doing something that a good officer should do, which was standing up for truth. Now, that being said, I'm sure there are a lot of people who would like to get into a room alone with Art Perot sometime to give him a piece of their mind and let him know a little bit about how you feel. Well, I want to get at the head of that line. And I'd like to really take a round out of Art Perot because he disgraced the uniform that I wore and a lot of other brave men and women wore with honor and with virtue. So I'm mad at him because of what he did to a lot of you, but I'm even more angry at him because of what he did to that uniform. Anyway, I'm really delightful, delightfully happy and proud to have been here with you uh, for this event. 
But I can't tell you how much admiration I have for you, those of you who stood up and those of you who haven't but are here. Uh, you're real. You're powerful. You're strength. And you're the reason that, that we're going to get a handle on this mess and turn it around. So a couple of uh, I, I, uh, couple, couple of three announcements and uh, four announcements, and then um, we'll close up. The first is I can't believe I didn't announce the fact that there are snacks over there at the table, um, and I'm getting on a plane this afternoon, and I don't think I can fit them all in my baggage. So please, please stick around, and please, pardon me. I could try. Okay. okay, never mind. Don't touch the snacks. Um, no, thank you. Um, there are also information sheets here by, uh, by the door. There's, I think, three maybe, maybe four. Please take one of each. Um, we've not acknowledged, or I guess one or two people have mentioned um, Brad Hall and his legal team who are somewhere. There's Brad with the, with the fancy hat on. Um, tremendous advocates. I am, uh, I am getting on a plane today, but my contact information, and I'd love to hear from any of you all, um, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in, uh, in Q&A, and, and uh, normally I will stick around this afternoon as long as I can, and I'm sure Tom will and others will too, but please, please, uh, you know, if you want to give me feedback, if you want to tell me your own story, if you want to be a part of you know, this movement on an ongoing way, please, please look me up on the SNAP website. Little buttons. Again, the website is snapnetwork.org. Uh, little button, contact us, click on there. My name and my phone number and my email address uh, are, all, are all on there. Um, many of you have seen or heard about this movie Spotlight. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to see it. But what you all are doing, what each one of us is doing in our own way, is shining a bright, bright, long overdue and sorely needed spotlight on this dreadful, dreadful crisis. Um, and uh, you should feel incredibly proud of your role in this. Um, maybe you didn't get involved as early as Tom Doyle did. Uh, maybe you feel like you should have spoken up louder, perhaps, <laughs> as Mark did. But, um, but Mark nailed it when he said, these kids cannot protect themselves. That's our job, every last one of us. And when bishops talk about healing services and apologies, you know, I, my first reaction is always, look, no offense, I'm a grown up. I can heal myself no matter what a bishop or an archbishop or a cardinal does or doesn't do, right? I mean, some kind of acknowledgement helps, um, but our daughters, our sons, our granddaughters and grandsons cannot protect themselves. And so as you leave here today, I would just encourage you to remember four simple things. You are not, as John said so eloquently, you are not alone. You did nothing wrong. You are getting stronger and better. I used to describe it as a recovery as a roller coaster, but that's a terrible analogy because everybody knows that the, at the end of the roller coaster, you're safe again, right? No, recovery is like being blindfolded on a roller coaster that has no end. But, but you are, in fact, even in your worst moment of loneliness and weakness and confusion, you are in fact getting stronger and better. And I beg you to remember that. And remember too that you are in fact protecting children. So please, please be proud of it and please keep doing exactly what you're doing. Thank you all so very much for coming today.